Well, a very good morning to you all. It's good to be here. Good to see you. This is my first time up, up top here. It's quite a view, um, seeing you all, see all your faces. Um, folks, this morning we're going to be focusing our time, Acts 24, but we're going to be looking at verses 22 to verses 27. Uh, it'll be a little shorter than what we have been doing recently, but I think you will find that these are, are pregnant verses. Um, and, we, and, we, and we see rich gospel preaching in surprising places in this passage. So let's pray. Oh Lord, as you speak to us from your word, and you have promised to speak to us in your word, help us to listen, to understand, and to obey. Encourage us, equip us, correct us, convict us, and show us more of Christ. Show us our sin and lead us to the cross. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the great things about working our way through a, a book in the Bible, or at least a section of it, is that we begin to see that the same thing happens chapter after chapter. Many of the same themes, same kind of sermons. Many, many of the chapters are similar, but I think that can be one of the strengths of going through a book in the Bible, because as, as you do so, you begin to notice what a book is all about. Not just in isolated verses, but in, but in overarching themes. And so you can see, what, what, what is missionary work all about? Well, it's about, over and over again, it's about the word going out and God bringing people in. What is the mission of the church? You see it in Acts over and over. The word going out and God bringing people in. You begin to see the same things. And as you notice the same things, chapter after chapter, it gives you eyes to notice the the, the slight differences. And when you notice those those little nuances, you begin to ask yourself, so why is this here? So like this chapter, for example, it seems like any number of sections we read in Acts, here is Paul, before somebody else, talking about Jesus. Again, Paul talking about Jesus. I mean, we have 28 chapters in Acts. You think, couldn't Luke have just cut it down to a crisp 10 chapters? And then just did a little epilogue and said, and a lot of other similar things happened. But why did the Holy Spirit inspire Luke out of all of the things he could could have included, to include this little section, which seems so random and similar, and yet has some little differences that make the similarities even more striking. So what I want to do uh, this morning is point out to you two pairs of different but the same. Two pairs of different but the same in these verses, verses 22 to verse 27. Here is the first pair. Different place, same passion. Different place, same passion. Paul is in a different place, but but he displays the same passion. Now you recall Paul had been assaulted in Jerusalem. He's been accused of crimes he didn't commit. And he gives his defense. And then he is brought from, from one place to another. And now finally we find him as he is in Caesarea, which was one of the leading cities of the region. And now he finally gets to state his case before the governor Felix. Paul is in a different place. He has been in prison before, but he finds himself in prison again. And Felix, we read, refuses to make a decision. Verse 22, he wants Lysias. Remember, he he, he is the the tribune leader of roughly a thousand Roman soldiers. Waiting for Lysias to come back, the technical uh, legal terminology would be that he reserves judgment. Felix says, I reserve judgment. I want to get more information. I want Lysias to come. We have no record of Lysias coming. We we don't know if if it happened or not, or if Felix was just trying to delay. But in the meantime, he puts Paul in what turns out to be two years in custody. Now, he, he has some freedom. The text says that he has liberty, meaning that he is not chained up to a soldier. Someone is, is not looking over his back around the clock. And he has friends who can come and support him. Prisons in the ancient world were not like our prisons. You, you didn't get three meals a day, a gym, and, and television. You have, even in something like this, which, which was, was not a dungeon per se, 
You are left to the goodwill of outsiders to come and, and bring you a cloak or bring you a pillow or food each day. So, so, so he is in a different place. He is in prison. But you notice same passion. Paul's sense of purpose has not wavered. What, what Paul is about has not wavered, has not changed. In Acts, we see three separate missionary journeys. As you know, Paul starting in Antioch, going through the Mediterranean Sea, coming back to his home base. Now this is his, def- his defense section. And sometimes we put a firm line between missionary journeys and trials. But if you pay attention, you notice his trials seem a lot like his missionary journeys. This is not an interruption in his, mission, in his missionary service, but the fulfillment of it. Wherever Paul goes, whether he is going freely around the Roman Empire and he wants to stop here, there to share the gospel, or, or now he is brought against his will from place to place, he talks about Jesus. Do you see? What, that, that what everything in his conversational orbit comes back to. I wonder what your conversations come back to. My conversations recently have all come back to cricket. <laughs> or other times they come back to my toys that I tinker with. It all comes back to you. It comes back to your job, to your, to, or your studying, or your grandchildren, days gone by. Is it always about your hurts, your wounds, your problems, your, your exam stress, your, your pain, your disease, your aging body? Now, there is most definitely a time to talk about any and all of these things, but what is it that you find yourself most eager to talk about when you are free to talk about whatever you want to talk about? For Paul, wherever he went, whatever circumstances, whatever context, he wants to talk about Jesus. When Jesus is your passion, you'll never be without purpose. No matter where you are, if you are here this morning and you're thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm 45 years old and I did not think my life was going to end up like this, what am I doing here? If Jesus is your passion, your, your, your life will not be without purpose. If you think I'm, I'm 80 years old and I'm all alone and I don't know what I'm doing with the remaining years of my life, if Jesus is your passion, then you have a purpose. Wherever you are, you think, well, I must be here so I can tell some people about Christ. I must be in this job. I must have this situation. This, this is how Paul, Paul operated. Wherever he went, he had the same passion. No matter what was happening, no matter what the future would hold, no matter whether he was in plenty or want, different place, same passion. This is the great thing. Do you see, if your passion is ultimately about your job, if your passion is ultimately about your children, all of those things will disappoint. All of those things can be, can be taken away from us. But if your passion is about Jesus, no matter what happens, no matter where you are, where you end up, you have a purpose. Now, now folks, don't get me wrong here. All right? Because this is... This, this, this is something that I need to keep telling myself all the time. One of the dangers of preaching a sermon and your wife being in the congregation is that, is that in the weeks following your sermon, by way of gentle rebuke, she will remind you of things you said in your own sermon. <laughs> and this will be one of them. When I am moaning and groaning and griping about circumstances and contexts, when I am having a spirit of discontentment and restlessness, she will come back to this, as she's been doing up until this day, <laughs> reminding me that no matter where you are and no matter what your circumstances is, if your passion is Jesus, you have a purpose. So it was with Paul. Different place, same passion. Here is the second pair. And yes, this pair will be a little bit longer. I know some of you are thinking, wow, he's only got two points, two-point sermon, and he's already on the second point. He wants to get out of here. <laughs> no, we'll spend a little bit more time here. Different approach, same gospel. Different approach, same gospel. So you notice throughout, uh, throughout Acts, different approach. 
If he's in the synagogue speaking, speaking to Jews, he can start with the scriptures. He can, he can look at prophecies. He can explain that Jesus is the Christ. He, he can go to the Psalms. They, they have a general sense of, of messianic expectation, and he needs to prove that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And, 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 and that as Jesus is the Christ and, and the prophets uh, said he would die and he would be raised and this Jesus is him. And if he was in Athens, he would have a slightly different approach. And he, and he references there to, to, a, to a statue to an unknown God. And it says in one of your poets, we are all offspring and, and he has some cultural resonance. And he talks about the creator because there is a general sense that, that there is a God who takes care of us and sustains us. Paul would start at a different place, he would end up with the same message. Or or when he would have to give his defense in these chapters. He tells of his own story. Three times in the book of Acts, we have his conversation story. He he would, sorry, his conversion story. He he would talk about his his Jewish credentials. He would would try to defend that he is not against the law or against the temple. The fulfillment of these prophecies was found in Christ. Different approach. And so here with Felix, before Felix and Drusilla, slightly different approach. There's no record of his his talking about idolatry or quoting uh, uh, their poets. He doesn't start with Abraham and the patriarchs as far as we know. Obviously, this is a condensed version of what he said. He probably talked about the scriptures. That's when it says he reasoned. So he's reasoning from the Bible, but we don't know what text or to what effect. So your, your approach in sharing the gospel may vary. It may vary where you start. Do you start with some awareness that they believe in God or some awareness of sin? Do you start with the scriptures? Now, now, I think the scriptures should always be a part of your sharing, the faith, because it is the, it is the word of God that has, that has power to change people, not just our stories of how we were changed. Lots of different people around the world have lots of different stories of how they became better. The power is in the word, but you may have a different starting point with people. Are you keen to find what those points are in our culture? So, for example, maybe equality. Western society today loves the idea of equality. It's the buzzword. It's a big word today. I don't need to tell you that. You might talk to, how might you talk to a non-Christian? You say, well, the Bible has a lot to say about equality. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says we are all equal because we all have the same parents. We all come from Adam and Eve, all of us. So, so, and so white or black or Asian, wherever you are, wherever you're from, you can't say that anybody is better than, than another by virtue of their skin color or by their ethnic, ethnicity. We're all equal. We all come from the same person. And you know, we're, we're all born in this world with the same nature, a fallen nature. We're all bent in on ourselves. Do you see the equality there? And do and you know that God gives to us all the same gospel? And you don't have to be rich or poor. You don't have to be in any certain race or gender. And he doesn't ask you to get a certain degree or to do a, a number of good things. He freely offers this gospel, this forgiveness, if you will turn from your sins and turn to Christ. Now, that may not be what the world always means by equality, But you start there and you give them Jesus. We have to be aware of the common ground that can can be assumed. Is there an awareness of God? Is there an awareness of of, of the spiritual worlds? Some people have a sense of right and wrong. Some people have a knowledge of the Bible or Israel's history. We see this with Paul. Varying his approach. Who is in front of me? Who am I talking to? But here is what he did not vary. He did not vary the gospel. Different approach, same gospel. And he didn't trim off the obstacles of the gospel. So when I say different approach, I don't mean, well, Paul kind of looked out and saw, well, you know, 
you're all kind of idolaters, and if I bring up idolatry, that's kind of going to be a bit sticky. So Jesus will fill the God-sized hole in your lot in your heart. Jesus will give you purpose and help you as an employer. Now that could be true, but that's not what I'm talking about. Different approach. Paul would start in a different place. He knew there were different assumptions, but he always gave them the same gospel. And we see it here with Felix and Drusilla. You see, he starts verse 24 by speaking about faith in Christ. Faith in Christ Jesus. So Paul is doing something very particular here. He is telling them about faith in Jesus, who is the Christ, who is the fulfillment of these scriptures, and that Drusilla, as a Jew, would have been familiar with. And Felix, as one interested in the way, would have heard of. Jesus is the Christ, so he probably explains he had to be born, he had to die, and he had to be raised, and not just information is he giving them, but he is telling them about faith in Christ, about their need and your need to make a personal commitment. You see, it wasn't enough that Drusilla was, was Jewish. It wasn't enough that Felix had a rather accurate knowledge of the way. Paul says, okay, you have a history, Drusilla, fine. Felix, you're kind of interested, and you know something about this, fine. But I want to know what is your faith. I want to know in whom or in what do you place your trust. And and, and we have to, to get this, especially in this country. It's not enough that you would be pro-Jesus, and that you would have a little Jesus flag. Woo, go Jesus. It's not enough that you think morality is important or that you have a regard for the Bible. You remember the story in the the gospel of, of the scribe who comes to Jesus and says, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus is kind of impressed with him. He's asking a good question. He seems to really have a respect for the law. He really has an interest in the scriptures. He really wants to know um, know about how, how to obey God. He seems very favorable towards Jesus. You're a good teacher. And remember what Jesus said to him? I tell you the truth, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. Not far. That, that means you're close, but you're not in. You're close, but you're not in. That young man could tick a lot of boxes. I like Jesus? Check. I believe in God? Check. I want to know how to obey God? Check. I believe in morality? Check. I'm curious about spiritual things? Check. And Jesus says to him, you're not far, but you're not in. Because until you cross that that Rubicon, which is faith, Until you put your trust and your sole allegiance in Jesus, you're only close to the kingdom, but you're not in. You see, you can have an accurate, and this is the frightening thing, you can have an accurate understanding of Christianity and still be miles away from faith in Christ. Any of you you young people, children, anybody who has been around the church for a long time and you have an accurate knowledge, you know things about the Bible. You understand true things about Jesus. It's great, and it's possible that you are no further along than Felix. He had an accurate knowledge of the way. He knew some things. He was interested. He was curious. And he was miles away from actually having faith, a personal commitment in Christ. And then you notice it says that Paul, verse 25 reasoned with them, probably from the scriptures, reasoned. You know, us, 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 us Christians, are, are, we are sometimes accused of being anti-reason, irrational. But look, of, of all people, Christians should be the last people to be anti-intellectual or anti-reason. No, we love reason. Faith has its reasons. This past week, I, w- I was up in London at, at a ministry conference and, and, and the main speaker, D.A. Carson, at one point got to, got to talking about marriage in our culture. And he said, we haven't lost the marriage argument. And I thought, we haven't? 
He said, no, 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 we haven't lost the marriage argument because no arguments have really been made. He said, in a culture of aesthetics, it's not arguments, but sentiments. It's what seems right, what feels right, what makes us feel about, better about ourselves. So the task in some of our pre-evangelism may be to, be, to, to convince one another of the law of non-contradiction, of the rules of, of logic, perhaps. People need to see, and, and maybe some of us need to see, and, and, and he spoke about this, this profound, deep inconsistency in our culture. He went on to say, here is the inconsistency, that on the one hand, we would boast in the supposed objectivity and rationality and proofs of science. We test everything, it's reason, it's rational, it's objective, truth, science. And on the other hand, we would make our moral decisions based purely on subjective impressions and theories that have never been tested. Do you see the deep cultural inconsistencies? I can't be a Christian because I believe in science. And I can't be Christian because when it comes to my moral decisions, I just believe I'm doing whatever I feel. The very opposite. So science says you've got to have facts, you've got to have theories, you've got to have reasons, you've got to have arguments, you've got to prove it to me. But then when it comes to how I actually live my life, well, it's just whatever I feel like. You see the deep inconsistencies, and until we can begin to help people see that there is something deep and wrong about inconsistency, people may not be willing to even to consider Christianity. We as Christians of all people are not against reason. Now, there are mysteries that are above reason, we're not, we're not, but we're not irrational. We are, we are not scared of arguments. And so Paul is here reasoning with them. And what does he reason about? Well, righteousness, self-control, you notice, and the coming judgment. Righteousness, that is about uh, justice, personal integrity, and then self-control, one of the fruits of the Spirit, a term usually uh, used in the New Testament with, re with reference to sexual propriety. And coming judgment, that Jesus is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Now, if you're anything like me, you take a step back from that for a moment and you say, whoa, Paul, time out, buddy. Whoa. Faith in Christ Jesus. That, that sounds like the gospel. Absolutely. But now you're going all legalism. You're going all veggie tales in us. You're just telling us what to do. You're, 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 you're moralism, Paul. I thought, we have, I thought you were gospel, Paul. Tell, tell them about the love of God and tell them about their acceptance and tell them about their freedom and tell them about their liberation. And now you've got this chance before the governor and his wife and you're lecturing on, on, uh, you're lecturing on and on about righteousness and self-control and judgment? Paul, what has gotten into you? Is this some kind of Santa Claus theology? You know, he knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows everything, so be good for goodness sake. Is that what he's doing? Is that, is that what he's doing? He's just sort of shaking a finger and he's saying, you know, he's saying he's coming back, so you better be good. You better clean up your act. Paul, what's happened to your gospel? Well, maybe a little history will help make sense of this. This morning, you're going to hear from Flavius Josephus. Have you ever wondered why your, your pastors you've had, they just start saying things like, well, you know, historically, blah, 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 blah. And you just sort of take their word for it. You know, the context here is there had just been an alien invasion. And you're like, oh, okay, better write that down. He's done the work. He knows what he's talking about. He's done, he's done the study. Where do pastors get this stuff from? Well, one of the ways is to look at other sources from the first century that tell us something of the history of the day. And one of the most important is a guy by the name of Josephus. This is, this is uh, this, well, not this, this piece of technology, but this is, this is the complete works of Flavius Josephus. He was a historian, born 37 AD, Jewish, and later in life defected to the Roman side. And in 94 AD, he wrote a book called The Antiquities of the Jews some of their history. And let, me, let me read to you just two sections and see if this makes sense of what Paul is doing. Here is the first. Josephus writes this. He says, Felix 
also bore an ill will to Jonathan, the high priest, because he frequently gave him admonitions about governing the Jewish affairs better than he did, lest he should himself have complaints made of him by the multitude, since he it was who had desired Caesar to send him as procurator of Judea. So Felix contrived a method whereby he might get rid of him. Now he was become so continually troublesome to him. For such continual admonitions are grievous to those who are disposed to act unjustly. Wherefore Felix persuaded one of Jonathan's most faithful friends, a citizen of Jerusalem, whose name was Doris, to bring the robbers upon Jonathan in order to kill him. And this he did by promising to give him a great deal of money for so doing. Doris complied with the, with the proposal and contrived matters so that the robbers might murder him after the following manner. Certain of those robbers went up to the city as if they were going to worship God while they had daggers under their garments, and by thus mingling themselves among the multitude, they slew Jonathan. So Felix has this high priest, Jonathan. He says, I don't like him. He's always nagging, always thinks he can do a better job. So I'm going to get his friend Doris, Doris, or not Dora, not Dora the Explorer, Doris, you're going to go up and you're going to get these dagger men, these Sakari, they're, they're terrorists basically, and they're going to go to Jerusalem and they're going to mingle around the people hid with hidden daggers and they kill Jonathan. Josephus goes on to say that, that they began to terrorize the city like this until everyone in Jerusalem was scared even to go out because there are men hiding their daggers. This is what Felix did. I have somebody I don't like. I'm going to kill him, and it leads to ter terrorism in the city. You see, a reason Paul wanted to lecture him on righteousness, on justice, and self-control. Let, let me read for you another passage, um, another part of it. So he, he, it says here, Josephus says, So Claudius sent Felix, the brother of Palus, to take care of the affairs of Judea. And when he had already completed the twelfth year of his reign, he bestowed upon Agrippa the Tetrarchy of Philip and Bithynia, and added thereto Tratonitis with Abila, which last had been the Tetrarchy of Licinius, but he took from him Cael Calchas when he had been governor there for, of, for four years. So, okay, you re, let me explain that. You, you remember Herod, all right? That there is Herod the Great. He was the one who had, he was the king when Jesus was born in order, to, in order for the young boys to be killed. He was called Herod the Great because he did some impressive things, even though he was a bit of a scoundrel. Then there was Herod Agrippa. Agrippa. So you have this whole dynasty of Herods. Herod Agrippa I died in Acts 12. He, he comes out. He is, he is in his royal robes. He thinks he's a bit of a big shot. And the people say he's a god and he enjoys it and the real god kills him. Then he has a son, Herod Agrippa II, and that's this guy, who was given the Tetrarchy. So when, Her when Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided into four quadrants. The leaders were called Tetrarchs, right? Four, or, or a fourth of. And so he gives them these different regions. Now listen what happens when Agrippa II receives these kingdoms. And when Agrippa had received these countries as the gift of Caesar, he gave his sister Drusilla. Okay, so Drusilla is the younger sister of Agrippa II, the daughter of King Agrippa, the first who died in earlier on in Acts. So he gave his sister Drusilla in marriage to Azizus, king of Emesa, upon his consent to be circumcised. For Epiphanes, the son of King Antiochus, had refused to marry her because after he had promised her father formally to come over to the Jewish religion, he would not now perform that promise. So, the, so this was very common, all right? Drusilla was probably just 14, 15 years old. Her older brother, as a kind of gift and celebration, gives her to be married. And first, she's supposed to marry this guy Epiphanes, but he has an epiphany that he doesn't want to become a Jew. He doesn't want to be circumcised, and so he backs out. And then she is given to Azizus, who is, who is king of, an area, uh, of the area in, in Massa, kind of Syria today. And, and he gets circumcised as the Jews required, and she marries him. Now listen what happens. But for the marriage of Drusilla with Azizus, it was no long time afterward dissolved upon the following occasion. 
while Felix was procurator of Judea, he saw this Drusilla and fell in love with her. For she did indeed exceed all other women in beauty. And, and he sent to her a person whose name was Simon, one of his friends. A Jew he was, and by birth a Cypriot, and one who pretended to be a magician. Ah, perhaps Simon the magician from earlier on in Acts? Nope, different guy, but good question. All right? So, 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 so this, this magician, and endeavored to persuade her to pos- forsake her present husband and marry him and promised that if she would not refuse him, he would make her a happy woman. Accordingly, she acted ill, and because she was desirous to avoid her sister Bernice's envy, for she was very ill-treated by her, by her on account of her beauty, was prevailed upon to transgress the laws of her forefathers and to marry Felix, and, and, and when he had had a son by her, he named him Agrippa. Do you see what's happened? Felix says, ah, Drusilla. She is, she is beautiful, I want her, and so he contrives a plan to influence Drusilla. Leave your current husband, this King Azizus, and why don't you marry me? Which she does. And, and you have a little sympathy because she is 18, 19 years old, but still what she did is, was wrong, to wrongly divorce one husband, marry another who is a pagan, who wasn't circumcised, Gentile. And you especially see what Felix has done here. Felix is on his third wife. And he, and he got his wife, Drusilla, because he just said, oh, she's beautiful, let's arrange to leave that, this husband, and I'll take her. So do you understand why Paul, when he gets an audience with these folks, is going to reason with them about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment? You know, pe- people, people today talk about relevance. You know, I, I want the preaching to be relevant, I want, I want my church to be relevant. Well, you know, I say amen to that. I didn't go into ministry to be ir- irrelevant. But relevance doesn't mean, hey, tell me what I like to hear. Relevance isn't telling people what they need to hear. And this is precisely what Felix and Drusilla needed to hear. Paul did not look for, for the least offensive lowest common denominator way to share his faith. He did not say, well, you know, here's the, 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 here's the kind of things that they will like that are, that are true in Christianity, and here's the things that they won't like, so I won't kind of do those things right here. He didn't, he didn't do that. Paul could have just said, well, you know, Felix and Drusilla, everybody knows what, what, what happened here, and he knows that I know, so I, I, I don't, I, I just, I'll, I'll just stick to the basics. Believe in Jesus, he'll give you joy, he'll give you purpose in life, he'll fill the God-sized hole in your soul. And just leave it at that. That's not what he did. He said, this is what you need to hear about. It's righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. It's the same gospel message which always has these same two components, faith and repentance. Repentance. Faith and repentance, just like John the Baptist when he burst on the scene. He said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And when he would would speak truth to power with another king and his his illegitimate woman in Mark 6 before Herod and Herodias. Just like Jesus in Mark 1, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Not just a message of acceptance, but also a message of repentance. If you separate these two things, you get a false gospel. If you take out acceptance and you just have repent, then your message becomes, shape up, try harder, shame on you. You need to be better. That's not the gospel. But likewise, if you just preach acceptance and you don't talk about repentance, you've not given them the gospel. If you just say, look, come to Jesus. He loves you more than you know. He'll forgive you more than you know. He will make your life better than you can possibly imagine. And and you never tell them that in turning to Christ, they also must turn from their sin. Well, then you haven't given them the gospel. Which is why, folks, with this month that we've just had, this pride month, this homosexuality issue cannot be an agree-to-disagree issue. 
Like some churches, you know, some churches baptize babies, some don't. Some think this about the millennium, others think that. Some use a lot of water in baptism, others use a little. Some use real wine, some use grape juice. Important issues, churches have have whole denominations based on some of those issues. But homosexuality is a different issue even to those. Because it does strike at the very core of the gospel. Well, you call people in whatever sin, whatever sin, to repent and to believe in Christ. If it is only a message of acceptance without a message of, of repentance, for all of us, every sin, I'm, I'm not picking on anyone here, if you, if you don't have a message of repentance and acceptance, you have not preached the gospel. This is what it, it often comes down to. Do we really believe in what Paul was preaching? Righteousness self-control, and the coming judgment. Do you believe that? In the, in the Sundays, the few Sundays that have gone, um, we, we've heard about God's wrath and God's judgment over and over. And people, are, people can say to you, well, isn't that that hellfire and brimstone church? And you say, well, it can get kind of chilly in here. Yes, hellfire and brimstone and judgment. You, you need to resolve now in these, in these friendly confines what you believe. He reasoned with them about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. You don't have to be brilliant to figure out that the coming judgment probably means there is a judge who is coming. Do you believe it? Do you really believe it? This week, I, I happened to be watching a bit of television, as you do, but I happened to, to see a bit of the Noah movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's basically like the Bible story in that there's a guy named Noah and there's a boat. And then I think the orcs are sort of a marginal reading or something. But if you haven't seen it, here is, here is one takeaway. As you're watching it, here is the one takeaway, one of the takeaways. You think to yourself, something like this is going to happen again. And you think to yourself, you know, you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, that's so puritanical. It's biblical. 1 Peter 3, Peter is saying, where is the promise of his coming? People were saying this Jesus, he's never coming back. And Peter says, well, that's exactly what they thought in Noah's day. And just as the world that existed was deluged in water and perished, he says, by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. That was Peter, Peter's inspired takeaway from Noah. Something like this is going to happen again, a coming judgment. And you see, what happened with Felix? Well, we see that he was alarmed. Sadly, there are whole churches and books and conferences and pastors who teach you that the absolute test of your gospel is that no one would be alarmed by it. That wasn't Felix. Emphobos, phobos, phobia, fear, terror, terrified, alarmed. That's how he felt. Is anyone ever alarmed by your gospel? They ought to be. Because there is something terrifying that is coming. You know, Revelation chapter 6 says that the people, as the mountains fall and the rocks fall and the earth cataclysmic, cataclysmically splits apart, it says they will flee from the wrath of the Lamb. The Lamb who was slain for sinners will be an impeccable foe of those who never turned from their sin. Paul had discharged his duty. What Felix did with it was up to him. And we see what Felix is like because he can hear a message about righteousness and self-control and judgment. And the very next thing is, hmm, well, maybe I can hear from him again because I might get a bribe. He had heard enough. Felix was stirred, but he was not changed. When you come to church, folks, do you know that you are in the position of greatest privilege but also greatest danger. Because you will hear the Bible, you will hear God, and if you do nothing with it, your heart will get harder, you will get more, more, more calcified to the truth. Felix had an interest in the way, 
He was a confused man. He was a torn man. Just a few years after this, he would, there would be infighting between Jews and Gentiles and in Caesarea, and Felix would be relieved of his post, and there is no record that he ever came to really have faith in Christ. Where do you stand with God? I mean, really stand with God. You may have a knowledge of Christianity, but have you a faith? in Christ. You may know the good news of acceptance with God through the cross. Do you also know the good news of of the freedom from your sins, from the blood on the cross? You cannot truly, truly turn to Christ unless you also turn from your sins. And I would be unfaithful this morning if I did not say that to you. And I did not reason with you about righteousness and justice and self control and the coming judgment. And the good news, of course, is that when you put faith in Christ, there is forgiveness for for, for these sins. As the hymn writer said, the double cure saved me from wrath and make me pure. (coughs) Will you listen like Felix? Be curious like Drusilla? And then go on stirred, but never changed? Or will you say, I repent I repent. Help me. Help me to change. Help my weakness. My only help, my only comfort, my only trust, my only hope, all I have to hold on to, my only freedom, is in Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, In the name of Jesus, we pray that you would send your spirit to preach this word to our conscience. Afflict us that we might be saved. Preach this word now, now and and the rest of today, through this week, that none here would remain in their sin but would turn and run and flee to the cross and find their forgiveness and freedom in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.